equal to g of x over h of x, and that's our rational function, where g of x and h of x most specifically have no factors in common. This is going to be important later, so don't read over that part. f of x, the function, is going to have a 0 where that numerator is equal to 0. We will have x-intercepts where the numerator is equal to 0. But because you cannot divide by in, uh, 0, okay, f of x is going to be undefined when h of x, the denominator, is equal to 0. So now we can look at these functions and do Bobo, Bot, and Betsy to talk about the horizontal asymptote. And then we can also look at this function to discuss the zeros and the undefined values. Okay. If we have this graph, we've already looked at it. You guys already told me we have a horizontal asymptote at 1, so it's a Betsy graph, right? Let's find the zeros and the undefined values. Well, the zeros, remember, are going to occur where the numerator is equal to 0. And the undefined values are going to occur where the denominator is equal to 0. So if we're finding these zeros first, all we have to do is take the numerator factors, x plus 2 and x minus 4, and set them equal to 0. Our little shortcut with the zero product property says that the zeros of this function are at negative 2 and at 4. Do we follow? Yes. Okay. If we look at the graph, this should make sense. Where are the two places that this graph crosses the x-axis? Negative 2 and 4. That makes sense. That's the places that the function told me it would cross the x-axis because that's where the numerator would be equal to 0. Now let's talk about the undefined values. Again, we cannot divide by 0. You can't take things and put them into 0 groups. It makes no sense. So our undefined values are going to occur where that denominator is equal to 0. Using my little shortcut with the 0 product property, what are the two numbers where we will have undefined values? 0 and so let's look at the graph. What is happening on the graph at those two values, at 0 and at 5? Um, Here's 0. There's a, vertical there's a vertical asymptote at 0, and there's a vertical asymptote at 5. Next class, we're going to get into details of why, in particular, that occurs. But for today, we're just going to uh, bleep, bleep, bleep. sorry, we're just going to call those undefined values. So we have our zeros of x equal to negative 2 and x equal to 4, and we have our undefined values of 0 and 5. Those are the places where those particular characteristics for this rational function occur. Do we see how I got it from the equation? Top is zeros, bottom is undefined. And do we see what it looks like on a graph? Cool. What if I don't give you a graph and I don't give you a function where it's in factored form? What should you do first with a rational function? This time I'm not asking Bobo, Bot, and Betsy, so we do have to factor. Okay, to determine the zeros, we are just looking for where the numerator is equal to zero. But I'm gonna caution you now that when you're dealing with rational functions, you need to factor both the top and bottom every single time, just in case what happens in this problem happens. If we were to factor the numerator, we practiced factoring last class, what would this factor to? x plus 1 and x plus 5, because 5 times 1 is 5, 5 plus 1 is 6. What would the denominator factor to? X plus 5. That's the difference of two squares, so x minus 5, x plus 5, or vice versa, the order doesn't matter. Aha! The reason we want to do this, do you notice something is on both top and bottom? Oh my gosh, that is a factor in common. If you read back up at the top of our paper, it says this only happens when they have no factors in common. So what we need to do once we factor this is we need to cross out those factors they have in common. Those are not going to be zeros for this function. It's something else that we will discuss next class. So now that we have factored and gotten rid of the common factors, my equation now looks like this. x plus 1 over x minus 5. 
Once it has no factors in common, we look only at the numerator to determine the zeros. And so we say, okay, we're going to find out where x plus 1 is equal to 0. And with my shortcut, what's the answer? Negative 1. Negative one. That is the 0 for this function. That is the place where the graph would cross the x-axis. If you didn't factor both and cancel out the common factors, you'd try to tell me it also crosses the x-axis at negative 5, and it actually does not. And again, next class we're going to discuss why. That's the basics for today. Do we understand the difference between zeros and undefined functions? No. no. Can you ask a question to clarify? I don't know this well, I just taught it to you, so you're going to ask questions to clarify. So if we go back to the top, any factor that's in the numerator, you're going to set equal to 0 and say that that is a 0 of the function in the numerator. Any factor in the denominator, you're going to set equal to 0, and that is an undefined value. So on the graph, this makes sense because the two places where the numerator would be equal to 0 is at negative 2 and at 4. That's where the graph physically crosses the x-axis. And the two places where it was undefined, we have these vertical asymptotes appearing. So it's a break in the graph. If we're just looking for the zeros of a function, we're just looking for where the numerator would be equal to 0. However, that only works if the rational function has no factors in common. So we factored first. If you need to write a word for yourself, maybe tell yourself factor first. We cancel out common factors, and then we can set the numerator equal to 0 and solve. Now that we've identified zeros of a function, we can use that idea to solve inequalities. And this is why we practiced inequalities at the beginning of class. This is the same information from when we did this with polynomials. If you have f of x greater than 0, that means you're looking for where the graph is above the x-axis. And if you have f of x less than 0, oh, wrong color, that means you're looking for where the graph is below the x-axis. That's the same information from polynomials, because that's the concept of being greater than 0 or less than 0. That's above the x-axis or below the x-axis. So from a graph, very easy, because it's visual for us. We can see where this function is doing these different things. Hi, does anyone need a jeans pass? I think we sent people for jeans pass. Okay, but thank, thank you. you. So if we're looking, and we're highlighting, we're going to highlight this graph everywhere it's above 0 in green. Well, whatever color you pick, but for me it's green. So the x-axis, this part is above the x-axis. This little bitty part right here is above the x-axis. Bless you. And this part right here is above the x-axis. We can then go through and highlight the places where this graph is below the x-axis, which is these two pieces right here. Where is this graph actually equal to 0 or equal to the x-axis? OK, I'm going to highlight that one in blue because that was my zeros color. So if the questions are inequalities, not necessarily equals to 0, but greater than or less than, all we're doing is looking for where the graph is above or below 0, or above or below the x-axis. So if we answer these questions, where is f of x equal to 0? Yeah, we kind of already answered that one. So we would say x is equal to negative 1 and 2. That's a list, not a coordinate, because it's not in parentheses, yeah? So it's a list of numbers, negative 1 and 2. The next one wants to know, where is this graph less than or equal to 0? So I'm looking for where the graph is underneath or exactly on the x-axis. Not necessarily where, but how many pieces of this function are below or equal to? There's like two pieces, right? You have this piece, and you have this piece. Those are two separate pieces, which means we're going to have two answers in our interval. This would mean that we're going to have from negative 3 to negative 1, or from 2 to what number? Where is that? Where does it stop being underneath? 3. 
That vertical asymptote is going to stop the graph right there. So we're going to get close to but never touch 3. That's what an asymptote is. And then right after the 3, we jump up to the top. So that's where it would be greater than 0. Looking at this graph, if I ask you where is this function just straight up greater than 0, how many pieces are green? Three. So you need to have three intervals in your answer. Now this one is just greater than. So should I include any sort of brackets in my answer? No. We're going to have this one being greater than zero all the way from negative infinity to negative three. Or from negative one to two. Or from three to infinity. Those are the three pieces where the graph is above the x-axis or greater than zero. Now, question D is different. What's different here? It's asking for where this function is greater than or equal to what? Yeah. One. Ah, oh, thank you for saying that. This is my horizontal asymptote, isn't it? So we're actually looking for where this graph is above my end behavior line, my horizontal asymptote. How many pieces of this function are above the horizontal asymptote? Two. Are there any pieces that are going to be equal to the horizontal asymptote? No, because you can't touch any of the asymptotes. Okay? They're getting close to but never touching, which means we would answer this question with negative infinity, comma, negative 3, or 3 to infinity. So from a graph, above or below is easy. It's a visual thing. Is it above? That's greater than. Is it below? That's less than. Questions, comments, concerns? We, okay, that, thank you for asking. We do not need a bracket here. Even though the question says greater than or equal to, you will not actually ever touch the horizontal asymptote. It's going to get infinitesimally close to it, but it's still going to always be not touching it. That's what an asymptote is. It's a line it's never actually going to touch, so we don't need brackets. Thank you for asking. Cool. Graphs, easy, great. We highlight, we understand, we see visually what's happening. But then what if there is no graph? Like we solve polynomial inequalities without a graph, we're going to solve rational inequalities without a graph. It's essentially the same steps with a few adjustments. Because now we not only have a po one polynomial, we have a polynomial in the numerator and a polynomial in the denominator. Your prep step for solving, you need to make sure the inequality has a zero on one side, which all of these do, and that the function looks like this, meaning there's a single rational function, not two rational functions. Again, I'm not having you do problems like that today, but just as a warning, like they need to make sure they're all together. Um, we are going to solve two things for this kind of problem. We're going to solve g of x equal to zero, which is my numerator, and we're going to solve h of x not equal to zero. The equal sign with a slash in it means not equal to zero, because remember, my denominator cannot be equal to zero. But we need to know what numbers would be my zeros on top and my undefined values on bottom. Both of those numbers, both types of numbers, I'm going to include on my number line like we did for polynomials. We create our sign chart, and then we test the inter intervals to see which one is positive and which one is negative and interpret the sign chart for the given inequality from the problem, writing our answer in interval notation. Let's see what this looks like in practice. Okay, We're solving the rational function x minus 2 over x plus 6 times x minus 1. So if you notice, the first thing I did was the prep steps. It's equal to 0 or has a 0 in the inequality. There's one fraction. Check. I took the numerator and I set the numerator equal to zero. That will be my zeros on my number line. So I have a zero on my number line. Then I also set the denominator not equal to zero. You're not allowed to use those numbers. That's going to be an undefined value on your function, which means x cannot equal negative 6 and x cannot equal 1. So those numbers are also on my number line. Why did I put an open circle on these? I can't use them. Not equal, open circle. 
After that, the sign chart is exactly like polynomials, except that you're plugging it into a fraction. So if I were to plug in negative 10, that would be negative 10 minus 2 on top. That's a negative number. Negative 10 plus 6, a negative number. Negative 10 minus 1, a negative number. Negative times negative is positive. Negative divided by positive is negative. Do we follow? For 0, I pick 0 because it's easy to use. In between negative 6 and 1, I plug in 0 to the factored form. 0 minus 2 is 0. 0 plus 6 is a positive number. Did I say 0 minus 2 is 0? <laughs> oh my gosh. 0 minus 2 is a negative number. And then the last one, 0 minus 1 is a negative number. This would make a negative. This would make a positive. Do we follow? You do that for every interval, right? There's four intervals. One, two, three, four. So I plug in four different numbers to test the intervals. Then I have to think, what was the whole point of this? We're looking to see where this is greater than or equal to zero, which means I want this section and I want this section. Those are the two places where the graph is greater than zero. So I would color in on my number line the second interval and the last interval. That helps me, this number line helps me write the final answer. We would go from negative 6, not touching negative 6 because that's an undefined number, to 1, not touching 1, it's an undefined number, or from 2, which we can touch because that's a 0, all the way to positive infinity. So the sign chart idea is the same. It's just now a rational function. So we find the zeros of the top and the undefined values on the bottom. Can you try one? You've got an example right here to look at if you need some additional assistance, but you've got this example here. 2 over x minus 3 greater than 0. Don't panic when this one's significantly easier. I did that on purpose. But go ahead and give it a shot. Work with the people around you. I want to see if we can get started on our sign charts and these, these correct ideas. Let me, I just said this out loud, but I don't think me saying it without showing you makes any sense. If we were to set, I'm not going to do the whole thing yet. If we were to set the numerator equal to zero, we'd be trying to say two equal to zero. And does that make sense? No. So there are no zeros for this function. It's not going to cross the x-axis, but we can do the stuff in the bottom. So we set an x minus three not equal to zero. That means x cannot be equal to what number? Three. Your number line would look like this. Here's a number three. Here's an open circle. Can you take it from here? Like um, the number line shading? There will be after you do the test. There's just no zeros. No filled in circles, I guess. Let's go back to the start of this problem. When we're starting a polynomial inequality, I mean, sorry, a rational inequality, we take the numerator and set it equal to zero. But for this one, we were saying two is equal to zero. Does that make any sense? No, no there's no x to solve for, so there are no zeros. This two does not equal zero. In the bottom, to find the undefined values, you take whatever is in the denominator and set it not equal to zero, which means x cannot equal three. That is the only number belonging on my number line because there are no zeros, and there's only one place where this is going to be undefined. When we're testing these values, and I'm seeing some wild uh, notation when it comes to testing, and whatever works, works, I guess, but I would love to see this kind of work. What is a number that is less than 3? Zero. 0 is less than 3. We're going to plug in 0. Some of you plugged in negative 10. That's also less than 3. That's fine. If x is equal to 0, you would have a 2 on top and 0 minus 3 on bottom, which is a negative number. What is 2 divided by a negative number? A negative number. What is a number that's bigger than 3? Ten. 10. Sure. Love it. I love using 10. So then I have a 2 that's positive on top, and then 10 minus 3 on the bottom. Well, that's a positive number. 2 divided by a positive number is going to be a positive. I know you could tell me the exact number, and if that works out better for you, that's fine. I just care if the number you're getting out is positive or negative. The question here is, where is this function greater than 0? Well, there's only one section that was positive. There's one section that's greater than 0. And since it's an open circle, will I put a bracket or a parentheses around 3? Parentheses, because that's an undefined value. We can't actually touch it. This would be from 3 to infinity. 
Can we do another one together start to finish before we ask questions? Because maybe just seeing it a few more times will be helpful. Okay, number five. Full stop on number five. Is this one factored? No. Okay, we should always factor first when it comes to rational functions, which is why we practiced factoring last class. What is the top, the numerator factor to here? x minus 2, x plus 2. That's the difference of two squares. What is the bottom factor to? x minus 5, x minus 5. Say a perfect square trinomial. Does anything cancel out here? No. no. Okay, so if we were finding the zeros, we would be fine because nothing cancels. We can just deal with it like this. When we're solving an inequality, well, I'm stuttering so much today. When we're solving an inequality, we're going to take the numerator, the zeros, and set them equal to zero. So I'm going to do x minus 2, x plus 2, equal to zero. If I'm quickly solving this one, what are my two solutions here? 2 and negative 2. Now the difference, and I saw some questions on this, from this question, having a solution, or having a zero, and the one we did before having a zero, not having any zeros, is that there is no x's in the numerator here. There are no x's in the numerator. There's no place for sure it's going to cross the x-axis. Okay, once I find the zeros, I also need to find the undefined values. So I set the denominator, x minus 5, x minus 5, not equal to 0, because we can't use those numbers. These are both the same. So what is the one number I can't use based on the denominator? x cannot equal 5. It's the same for both. We don't need to write it twice. It's not going to equal 5. Cool, 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 great. We need to draw our number line. How many numbers belong on this number line? Three. We're gonna make sure they go in number order. So this is negative two and then two and then five. I don't care how far apart they are. We just need to see them in number order. Negative two, open circle or closed circle? Closed for now. At two, open circle, closed circle. And then at five, open. open. Now, the reason we did this is because negative 2 and 2 are zeros. That's places where it does cross the x-axis. At 5, it's not equal to 0, so it's open. However, what kind of inequality are we solving? Um, like less, than. less than. Is it equal to? No. So will we actually be able to use brackets on these guys? No. no. I want to leave them as zeros because I personally like to see that their zeros are just undefined values. But if you're going to get confused... It would be nice to leave those as open because you know that you can't use them in your final answer. So whatever works for you. In fact, I'll leave them like this for our notes. Okay, how many intervals are we going to have to test here? Four. There are four different places here. What number can I plug in for the first interval? I agree. I like using negative 10 because it's aggressively less than negative 2. If I plug in negative 10 and I go back to the factored form, Negative 10 minus 2 is a negative number. Negative 10 plus 2, negative. negative number. Negative 10 minus 5, negative. and negative 10 minus 5. Negative. Okay, negative time negative is positive. Negative time negative is positive. Positive divided by positive, positive. Whew. Do we follow that part? Yes. We need help with the sign charts, and I know we do, so I'm going to leave you to do the other three. Test three more numbers in the three remaining intervals. Just want to make sure we got that part. Oh, I guess I should show that. What is the number y'all chose to plug in between negative 2 and 2? I agree. That's a super easy number to use. So we would plug in. We'd have a negative and then a positive and then a negative and a negative, which would be a negative over a positive, which is negative. What number did you choose to plug in in the third interval? 4. Sure, we'll do 4. I picked 3 earlier. 4 works. 4 minus 2 is a positive number. 4 plus 2 is a positive number. 4 minus 5 is negative, which would be a positive over a positive, which is positive. What number did you choose to plug in in the final interval? Me too. Great. So then we have 10 minus 2, which is a positive number. 10 plus 2, which is a positive number. 10 minus 5 and 10 minus 5. Positive time positive, and then positive divide by positive is positive. Then don't get lost in all of the signs. We have to go back and answer the actual question. 
What was the actual inequality question here? What do I want to know? Less than, which means I'm only looking for this section that's less than, that's small, which would be between these two values. Now remember, those were zeros, but because I just want to know where it's below zero, not equal to zero, we're not using a bracket to give me the final answer here. We are just going to use the parentheses, negative two to two. And I'll scoot that up because I know you can't see it. From negative two to two, it's the only place where it's less than. If it had said equal to, we'd include the bracket. Questions, comments, concerns? Because you're about to try the next one on your own. Start to finish, the next one's yours. The top, again, kind of looks like the one I made you do the first time. Are there going to be any zeros for this one? No, okay, keep going from here, you got it. I want you to do start to finish. I kind of gave you a preview for this before we started, but since the numerator is just a plain number, there's no way that that number would ever equal zero. So we just say like, no, never mind. There are no zeros for this one. But if we do the bottom, we are going to have to factor. Did y'all factor that to x minus one and x minus one? Yes. Awesome. That means that we're taking those two terms, which yes, are repeated, and we're saying they cannot be equal to zero, which means that we know x cannot be equal to one. That is the only number, again, on my number line, and it's open because it's not equal, oh, I should put the number, not equal to one. How many intervals am I gonna have to test here? Two. two. What is a number less than one that's super easy to use? I agree, you could use negative 10 if you wanted, but zero is there. I would have one over a negative number times a negative number, which is one over a positive number, which is a positive number. What's a number that's bigger than one? Two, two. sure. I heard, I like using 10, but two technically is bigger than one. We can use it. This is gonna be one over two minus one, which is a positive number, two minus one, which is a positive number. This is one over a positive number, which is positive. So we think back to the actual question. I'm asking for where this graph is less than or equal to zero. Where is it less than zero? Where is it equal to zero? Nowhere. So the answer to this one is gonna be no solution. There's no place where this happens. There is actually a mathematical symbol for no solution, and I think I ranted about this in my other classes, but not in yours. This is the symbol for no solution. Oh. It's called the empty set. Now, the reason I rant about this is because if you write your zeros like this, oh, I already did too much. This is zero. This is empty set. That's theta. Those three things mean something different mathematically. So if you're going to use zero with a slash through it, this one is how you write a zero. This is the empty set, and this is theta. So you're telling me I can't write my zeros? I would recommend not slashing your zeros because you might accidentally tell me something is the empty set and that's different. Okay, but the, theta, T-H-E-T-A, it's a Greek letter. Theta, yes. Yeah. We're going to be using it a lot in trigonometry. It usually stands for an angle. 